Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations around money. I'm your host, Lauren, a four-time Olympian and certified financial planner. On this show, my guests share their money stories. Everyone has a unique story and experiences both wins and losses when it comes to money. My intent is to give listeners something they can relate to, something that builds their courage to be open and take control of their own money story. When I'm not creating a great show for my listeners, I'm running my company, Worth Winning, where I help individuals and families organize their finances. Check us out at worth-winning.com. All right, now on with the show. All right, welcome back. Summer is wrapping up, and I know you all enjoyed the series that Chloe and I did up to this point. Um, I was able to drag her out a little bit past the halfway mark for the year, and I can tell by viewership and emails, or not viewership per se, listenership, and emails that we have received that you all thoroughly enjoyed the No Better, Do Better series, and that you all are more educated because of it. I am actively trying to coerce Chloe into coming back on on a more long-term basis, but TBA on when that will actually pan itself out. Uh, We are working on some cool projects in the background, and I want to share one project that I'm working on specifically. It is financial retreats. So this is something that I have been talking about for years wanting to do retreats, wanting to be able to have that as a service offering. And I spent so much time kind of building a traditional financial planning practice that I'm really proud of and I believe fills the gap for a lot of young professionals. But I think that this is an area of passion that I have to pursue. And it's like not like soon, it's like right now. So as of October the 14th, we are launching the Worth Winning Retreat. So check out the website. We are doing Thursdays through Sundays, Tuesdays through Saturdays, or Saturday through Saturday. So you can do either what, three days, five days, or seven days. And the big news is that those seven day retreats are going to be international. So often people are, I need to get my finances together. I will get my finances together when I don't have time to work with a financial planner. So why not just show up to one place, have everything taken care of, kind of do a staycation in your city and spend that time getting your finances organized while having an experience. I am going to go ahead and drop the first three locations for you so you can get excited, head to the website if you are one of the people that is in those cities or wants to head to that city in order to be a part of the financial planning retreats. Location number one is Atlanta, Georgia. Retreat number two will be happening in Dallas, Texas. And retreat number three will be in Houston, Texas. Even bigger news is that for the new year, we will launch international retreats in January. So if you're looking to be out of town to start your new year off, you will be going to an international location yet to be disclosed. I am really, really proud of this. And I just wanted to share that with the the listenership. I want you to be able to encourage others to get help with their finances in the way that is going to be most applicable to them. So there's one-on-one advice with a financial planner. There's podcasts, there's blogs, there are, you know, various courses. And I, I believe that retreats are going to bring people together. They're going to bring them together around something that they're already interested in doing, which is, like I said, having experiences and, you know, doing staycations and, and doing travel, but also going to allow them to get stuff done while on those trips or vacations. So look out for that. More information to come in the upcoming episodes. Today, you just get me. No guest as of yet. Of course, as we always say, if you would like to be a guest on our podcast uh, and you have an interesting money story, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. If you've been enjoying the podcast all year long or for the last three years, go ahead and leave us a review. That helps us be seen. It helps us spread the word, helps us have a larger impact on the people that we want to know better so that they can in fact do better. So keeping in line with knowing better and doing better, I thought today would be a great day to cover scary money questions and how to respond to them. You know that this podcast was born because I have experienced that taboo where people are not really comfortable talking about their finances. And, you know, you get a little bit fidgety when people ask you questions that you are not comfortable answering or you've been told not to answer. And so I just wanted to kind of like 
address some of the scary questions. So we've got six questions that have sometimes been labeled as scary, and we're going to talk through how you would answer those questions. So first and foremost, what is your credit score? So this is probably the least evasive. And if this one makes you squirm, you will simply want to die if asked any of the other questions that I'm going to bring up shortly. But credit scores ultimately are a reflection of how you've handled your finances over the past several years, generally the last seven years, actually. And you may be in a different place today than your score indicates. So, you know, you may be getting your finances organized. You may have cleared off some debt and your credit score is creeping up in the right direction slowly but surely, but it's not 100% an accurate reflection of your financial health. And so that's the reason that sometimes people are afraid to answer this question. Ultimately, the same way that your net worth is not equivalent to your self-worth, you are not your credit score. Great credit is great, but what does credit ultimately do? It allows you to take on more debt. Great credit, bunches of debt. And what is debt? Debt is bad. So while your credit score may not be perfect, Don't be so sad about it. Make sure you're focusing on organizing your finances to the best of your ability. And if your credit score is good, don't take that as I'm in the best financial situation. But either way, don't be afraid to share your credit score with someone. And what's the easiest way to work through a question that, you know, makes you feel uncomfortable? Ask the person a follow-up question. You know, why are you interested in knowing what's your credit score? The last thing I'll say about credit scores, just as an informational piece, is that credit scores are not run by the government. They are for-profit organizations that are actually maintaining your credit score. So a lot of times we think that this is the end-all, be-all, kind of like the IRS or other government entities. We give credit scores a lot of clout, but also it is actually a for-profit organization. And like I said, there are some things behind it that you need to understand. Question number two. How can you afford that? I feel like this is a question that is often asked in the, hey, I'm counting your pocket and I don't feel like you should be able to have that. Or I feel some sort of way about the fact that you can afford that and I can't. And it just simply shouldn't be that we are afraid to answer these questions. So how are we going to answer a question if someone asks you, how can you afford that? Well, you can say, I have a budget. I work my behind off. (laughs) I saved up for it. Now, there's always the alternative that maybe you can't actually afford that. And in that case, this might be a question that causes you to reflect on whether or not you can actually afford that, whatever that may be. But it's not the worst question on the planet. They are, you know, kind of dipping into your business, but evaluate the person on the other side of that question. Is this someone who cares about you and is, like you said, trying to make sure that you're doing what's in your best interest. You know, it could be somebody who's just being nosy and may not have their own finances organized, but it's okay to tell people how you can afford that. And like I said, if you're doing some awesome things like having a budget or working overtime or saving up, that could encourage the person on the other end of the question to do the same thing. Okay, scary money question number three. How much debt do you have? So for me, this is definitely one of those questions that you answer with a question. I can't figure out why someone would ask this without explaining themselves. My thought process is, are you going to help me pay it off? (laughs) Why would you want to know this thing about someone? I would say, yeah, I'm definitely taking donations if you want to help me (laughs) with this debt. But once again, what are we doing? We want to be more transparent with our with our finances. And it's not the worst thing in the world if someone asks you this. So just try transparency. Sometimes people are embarrassed about it. And so you can say that, you know, I'm embarrassed to tell you how much debt I have. I could really use your help with creating a plan to dig myself out of this hole. So there's all kinds of different debt. There's credit card debt. There's personal debt, car debt, student loan debt, mortgages, you know, you name it, it runs the gamut. So it also depends on what kind of debt someone has. I I found that people are more open to talking about student loans nowadays, but there are a lot of people who have six-figure student loan debt that are not comfortable sharing how much debt they have and they don't have a clear plan to handle it. And that's where the embarrassment comes from. If someone asks you this question and you just want to die inside, 
I would say we've got to ask ourselves the question, why do I feel so embarrassed if someone was going to ask me this? Um, It might be because I don't have a clear plan to pay it off. Or I'm embarrassed about, you know, what I did. So if it's credit card debt, I'm embarrassed about the fancy shoes that I bought. And now I've kind of come to my senses and I'm digging myself out of the hole. Transparency, though, can go a long way. And if I can just add a little color commentary here. This is not one question (laughs) that you want to keep from your spouse. So if you're embarrassed, if you're ashamed, if you have reservations about uh, sharing the amount of debt with some other person outside of your household, They may be warranted for various reasons, but where you do not want to surprise someone is by not sharing the debt that you have with your spouse. Please do not keep this from your spouse. All right, scary money question number four. Can I have or can I borrow some money? So borrow generally means have in in my experience. So you might as well say, can I have some money? Because Those that are in a situation where they need to borrow are generally not in a situation where they're going to be able to give it back anytime soon. And I know it is hard to say no. When you come from a community where lots of people around you are low income and everybody is scraping to get by and, you know, it's kind of survival of the fittest out there. He's like, we take care of each other and this is just how we have to do it. But as you evolve and, you know, you try to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, one of the things that can continue to hold you down is lending money to others and not just lending it, but now also not getting it back. So think about how you can say no in a nice way. If you've done a lot to organize your finances and this is an area where someone can derail you, it's okay to respond to them and say, I have all my money allocated. I do not have a line item in my budget to loan people money. That is a very plausible thing to say. And I now have a budget. It's not here. I have nowhere to put, you know, to put that thing. And I can't throw off my whole budget for whatever it is that the financial thing is that you're up against. The key thing for me about this borrowing is not to lie. I believe that there is power in the tongue and what you say can become your reality. So what you do not want to do is say, I don't have the money or I don't have any money, you can start to manifest those things into your life and make yourself broke. So instead of saying what you don't have, try asking some questions. Someone came and they asked you for money. What do you need it for? In the same way that they got bold enough to ask you, you are now well within your right to say, you know, what do you need this money for? What happened to the money that you earned? If you know they are gainfully employed, what did you do with the the money that you had? Help me understand where your money is going. You do get to ask those sorts of questions. You don't get to just be on the answering end of the question that they're asking you. And then generally someone who's going to borrow from you is someone who you care about. And so the other question I would ask is, are you living beyond your means? This is a great time to bring that up. If they bought shoes at the beginning of the month and now they're at the end of the month and they can't pay rent or vice versa, it's time to start having a conversation about making better decisions because once they spent all their money, You know, now they're coming to you to spend some of your money and and it doesn't allow you to plan accordingly. So don't be afraid to reverse it and ask if they need your help creating a budget. You should have one. And so you should be happy to share the knowledge of creating one with those around you, especially the people you care about. Okay, I think I beat that with a dead horse. So let's move on to scary money question number six. How much did you pay for that? We like showing off the car and are excited when we close on a new house, but it gets awkward when someone asks, how much did that cost? And if you asked me the reason why, I'd say it's probably because we don't want them doing the mental math on whether or not it is affordable to you or for them. So they may be trying to back into how much you're earning in order to be able to afford that thing. Now, if they're nosy, they will use an app to find out what other things in the neighborhood are selling for. And even in some states, you can look up the purchase price of a home. Okay, so let's talk about how to answer this question. Well, first, if you're confident that you didn't buy more than you can afford of whatever that thing is, you know, let's assume it's a house in this situation, you feel good about it. It was, in fact, a good decision based on your finances. It should not be a big deal to share. It is all about being more transparent with your funds and and empowering the people around you to get themselves organized so that they can feel really good about starting to make purchases similar. So, you know, if you're in a great situation, let's say, like I said, let's assume it's a house. 
you had your down payment, you still have an emergency fund even after your down payment, then be pumped to tell them, you know, I saved up, I got my down payment, I did my emergency fund, I'm so excited about this, this mortgage is affordable for me on a monthly basis. And since I'm using a mortgage as an example, the general rule there is like, if a mortgage is less than 28% of your gross income, then you're in good shape. I'm not the biggest fan of this rule because 28% of your gross income is going to be a lot more than 28% of your take-home pay. So you just want to be mindful of what your budget looks like, what you can afford on a monthly basis. I've definitely seen people out there with 50% of their paycheck going to their mortgage. And then that might be the reason you're not comfortable saying how much you paid for that because someone backs into what a payment would look like or what a, a down payment would look like. And they're like, "Woo, like we have the same job. How are you able to do this? And I'm not. If you're confident, though, in your finances, if you're confident in your ability to take care of things, then it's okay to share this information. Even when you're not confident, it's okay to share this information because know better, you're able to do better. And I know I'm talking about the scary questions, but since I've already kind of gone down the rabbit hole of talking home buying, some things to think about as you go down the home buying road is, are you still wanting to save for your kid's education? Do you need to pay off student loan debt? What about your other basic living expenses? And then there's that yard that needs to be taken care of and the electric bill. So be mindful. But when someone says, how much did you pay for that? You shouldn't be afraid to answer the question. However, it's always good to answer a question with the question. (laughs) And so what could you say to to someone before sharing your information? Maybe want them to share theirs. You know, are you thinking of moving into the neighborhood? I can connect you with my realtor. What's your budget? Great way to flip this question and answer the question with the question so that you can get a better understanding of where the person is coming from. Because sometimes people have good in questions and though the question made you uncomfortable, by simply asking a few more questions, you can realize like, oh, they're actually trying to gather knowledge and information and I might be a helpful resource to do that versus they're being nosy, which is kind of like the defense mechanism. You know, I know that that's my go-to is like, oh, why you want to know this? But gathering more information before you answer the question is totally okay. All right, last but not least, the big kahuna that makes us all want to avoid talking about money altogether. How much money do you have? I think that this is the reason that people don't want to talk about money in general, because when you answer this question, it's like, it's all been laid out there and I'm going to have to answer a million questions. Well, if you can find a way to answer this question you are now going to be free to talk about other topics that may actually be productive for both you and the person asking the question. Now, this one I would say is a private matter as I would say that knowing can result in some negative things happening. I think this comes up when people think that they know what you have. And so actually knowing could be even more problematic. So as an example, let's say you're doing really well or people see some you know, nicer items that you have. And they're already making some assumptions about how they can share your wealth, whether that be charging you more for something or asking you to borrow or somehow wanting to participate in your life in a way that's not going to be productive to you. On the flip side of that, it could be a situation where people think you're in some sort of financial trouble. Uh, You are in some financial trouble and they use that information to prey upon you. So the knowing exactly how much someone has can be used for a negative impact. So this is why this one totally makes people squirm. But as with the rest of the questions, there is definitely ways to answer it without the conversation going completely self. How about this as an answer? I'm always working to improve my financial situation and I'm happy to discuss ways in which we can both do that. Was there a particular reason you asked that question? Boom, way to flip it. So we didn't answer the question with the question, but we first kind of prefaced it with, I want to know better. I want to be better. So where is this coming from? So maybe you can even say something like, hmm, let's discuss savings and investments as those are the two big things that will help both of us grow our bank account. So you don't need to necessarily discuss the question per se, but you are saying I'm open to having more discussion about money in a way that's going to be productive for both of us. And while I'm on the subject, one person you should not keep this number from is your spouse. So I've already alluded to it earlier in the episode, but I have experienced separate finances as something that's become very prevalent, though it is not preferred, especially when working with a financial planner. 
And even if you all do decide to keep things separate, there are just some things that you need to share in order to give yourselves the best chance to succeed together. I cannot say it enough. Transparency is key. Okay, so that's the six questions. Let me just wrap them up for you one more time. What's your credit score? Can you afford that? How much debt do you have? Can I borrow some money? How much did you pay for that? And the big kahuna, how much money do you have? These are all questions that get people squirming, but they do not have to go unanswered. Hopefully I shared some good resources for how you can respond to these questions without the conversation going completely south. And remember, it is important that you don't immediately go on the defensive, but give the person on the asking end of the question the benefit of the doubt because when we know better, we can in fact do better. And that may be where their questions are rooted. Even if they're coming from a place of shame or scarcity or some other negative place initially, you get the opportunity by someone having the guts to ask you that question to flip the conversation into something that is positive and productive. As always, if you have questions, suggestions for guests, or you would like to be a guest on the podcast, please do not hesitate to reach out at worth-listening.com. 